Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll get this uh, get this presentation underway here. My name is Lance Newbold. I'm vice president for student affairs here at Rose State College. And on behalf of our president, Dr. Jeannie Webb, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's presentation at the H.B. Atkinson Theater. Uh, I'm not going to tell anybody anything that they already don't know. November is Native American Heritage Month. And there are a few places that I can think of that it's more appropriate to celebrate Native American heritage than in Oklahoma, and then here at Rose State College specifically. And the Rose State College AIA has done a tremendous job this entire month with educational and thoughtful and thought-provoking programming. And uh, under the advisement of Dr. Matt Spain, Michelle Aitzen Rossler, and Kirby Harsman, and uh, if you were part of the AIA planning and executing of all the events that we that you guys have done all month long, go ahead and stand up so we can recognize you guys. Okay, no one came here to listen to me talk, so I'm going to turn it over to to Matt Spain. I never get that. <laughs> um, well, um, actually, uh, Lance did a wonderful job of making sure we put the spotlight on our great Native American students here who have really um, done a wonderful job. Their leadership, their organization, for all that you've seen going on in this campus, this is them uh, that have really uh, been in the trenches and made all of this work. So, you know, I was going to ask for an applause, we just did it, but uh, it, it, I, this has been a great year so far, and we've only just begun. Um, again, this is all part of our activities for Native American Heritage Month. And I also think that this is an appropriate time in all of this with Dr. Pew already here, but also in this uh, mode of, of recognition, right, of the place of Native America within the greater American narrative. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to have, I think, the first uh, on this campus of what we would call a land recognition statement. And then I'll go from there. Um, and this, this, you know, this is our very first uh, land acknowledgement here at Rose State. I hope it's the first of many to come. Um, long before Rose State College was established, the land upon which the college now resides was the traditional home of the Apache, the Caddo, the Tonkawa, and the Wichita and affiliated tribes. We acknowledge that this territory once also served as a hunting ground, a trade ex exchange point, and a migration route for the Comanche, the Kiowa, the Osage, and the Quapaw. We also acknowledge that the Muscogee Creek and the Seminole were forcibly removed and assigned these lands by treaty with the United States. 39 tribal nations reside within the state of Oklahoma today. And the result of settler colonialism, policies that were designed to first exclude and then assimilate Native peoples are part of that history. But Rose State College recognizes the historical connection it has with its indigenous community. We acknowledge, honor, and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land. We fully recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereign rights of all of Oklahoma's 39 tribal nations. This acknowledgement aligns with our core value of creating a diverse and inclusive community. It is in an institutional responsibility to recognize and acknowledge the people, the culture, and history that make up our Rose State community. Like I said, I'm hoping that that will be part of, of many uh, academic gatherings from here on out. Now, for why we're here. Uh, a quick introduction for Dr. Thiwi Wordy. Dr. Cornell Weaverty, Comanche Kiowa, is vice chair of the Great Comanche Nation. He's also professor emeritus of Indigenous Nation Studies at Portland State University. His research explores the theoretical and philosophical foundations of post-colonial Indigenous research paradigms and the lingering impact of colonization faced by Indigenous peoples today, including mechanisms for Indigenous survival in the 21st century. His work advances policy and practices that address persistent racial and socioeconomic inequalities within indigenous education and reflect the voices and expertise of historically underserved families and communities. From his early work as an education administrator to more recent work 
on creating indigenous charter schools, he focuses on strategies to enhance higher education's connectivity and partnership with indigenous nations to advance the education of indigenous students and explore broader university tribal relationship-based pedagogy. Working closely with teachers and school leaders nationwide for three decades, he and his colleagues have created, and um, will be introduced to this today, a, transform a transformational indigenous praxis model. Uh, much of that is also being explored in his upcoming book, Unsettling Settler Colonial Education. And though he's retired, Professor Pee Weir continues to teach uh, in many on online and distance learning applications. So his, his, his work, his knowledge, continues to be an impact in the educational world. But he also serves on uh, a number of boards, things that are moving things forward. For instance, he serves on the American Indian Studies Advisory Board. Uh, we were just talking about this earlier. He's been uh, struggling hard, and finally uh, things have happened. But the founder of the Indigenous Days, uh, People's Day in Lawton, Oklahoma, that great recognition there. He's part of the, the Knowledge Keepers of the newly opened FAM uh, there at the, just down the road. Uh, and has also participates in editorial works in some of the leading academic journals in Native American studies. With all that work, he has received a plentitude, that's even a word, I got just come up with that, but a, or a plethora of, of, of academic accolades and awards. And the list can keep us here uh, until we run out of time. And I don't want to hog up any more time, but I just do want to mention probably two of the most recent one is that he was uh, awarded NCORE's that's National Congress on Race and Equality, but he received the Susan Sheldon Harjo Systemic Social Justice Award, very prestigious, as well as more recently, he was just, uh, and I think within the, well, I think within the last week-ish, I'm gonna kind of fudge that, a week-ish, uh, was uh, awarded from the Oklahoma Council for Indian Education. He is our Educator of the Year. And with uh, that, I'm gonna turn the platform over to Dr. Pee Wee Wordy. College, and I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you. Um, we'll, we, we're going to be here two hours, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a former professor, so I'm just accustomed for lecturing. But I, I put together some slides, but I do want to recognize all of you being here, and especially the name students, American Indian Association, uh, for having me here and uh, to spend some time and unfold some of the, the academic work that I've been a part of for the last 40 years as a, an elementary uh, teacher and principal and teacher educator and now I'm just uh, into the politics of being the vice chair of the Comanche Nation. So we have a lot of things that we're doing as part of nation building or what I call rebuilding. But I'd like to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that I'm here with my, my, my relatives and my daughter uh, Chantel Huey Wardy is also a student here at Rose State and I'm really proud of her and all the work that she's done. She's uh, followed me to Portland, Oregon and she followed me back here, back home to be in Oklahoma. So students just embrace my daughter and I'd be appreciate that. Also we have uh, a sister, a citizen of the Comanche Nation, uh, Cindy Fomero, uh, very familiar with uh, all the act, activism that we're, we're working upon in the, the community of Long Fort Sill. Um, she is a wealth of knowledge. She's also traveled across the country to see multiple uh, social developments and very active in what she does in MMIW and all the things that uh, women, uh, indigenous women, um, confront in this day and age. So I just want to say thank you. <coughs> When uh, Dr. Despain uh, talked about the land acknowledgement, this is just a snapshot <coughs> of so many um, we got the water, right? I have it right here. <coughs> of all the, 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 the footprint of uh, Native America. 
So when somebody does a land acknowledgement, there's somebody's indigenous land. That's part of that. So I think that thank you. That's really important. Not only that uh, uh, he gave a land acknowledgement, but I think that it moves further than that it, to become institutionalized within the uh, the website, the, the all of the uh, the course syllabi for every course. That should be a part of that landscape, uh, that because that's that's what I do when I teach at the University of Washington or Cameron or USAL or Bay Calm. Every time we start class, every course syllabi begins with land acknowledgement. So those are the things that I'll be looking for, and it doesn't have to be just native studies. It's every course, every class. This is really important. Um, what we see is real, really depends upon your worldview, where you're coming from. As somebody has spent his whole life being in the classroom and being a teacher of teachers, we begin to understand what is real, what is the eye of the beholder. And so that's why I start with this, this concept. But I've also brought my props. This is a my little pumpkin. I call it pumpkin theory. Because what this really means to me, because when I'm involved in um, discussions about making decisions, particularly decisions that evolve into policy, we have to be of the same consciousness. We have to be of the same plane and understanding to get to the charge, to the goals uh, that we want to accomplish. So every individual that comes together, whether it be a committee or study group, has their perception of the world. And if we're gonna be looking at a various charge, we come with that experience. So the pumpkin is just that. So I tell the students or whoever group that I have, we put it in the center of the table or, or the room, whatever it be, and I say, students, I can only see this slice of the pumpkin. And I can tell you what it looks like, I probably can tell you what it tastes like, but I cannot see the other side. I'm going to depend upon you to tell me what it looks like. Tell me that story because I cannot see it. I'm blind. And if you can tell me that story and I can tell you and we go all around, we're going to have a development of consciousness. So that's why I want to present that. That is a metaphor I use in each one of my classes to help them understand that we don't all come together in the same frame of mind, but we have a charge. So this is where I'm, I'm looking here. So I just thought I'd share that. That's teaching theory. But I also know teaching theory start where the learner is, their consciousness, their experience. I've got 40 years of experience working on this concept. It may be new language to you. It may be old language to you. It really, I, I don't know, I'm meeting a lot of you for the first time. That's why we have to start here with theory. Start where the learner is. So what I've been able to conceptualize is that power controls ability to articulate the concept and idea or reality, a worldview to another individual or group of people, and convince them that an impulse reality is real. This usually means that the individuals or groups of people were not able to conceptualize or articulate the concept idea or reality using their own process of critical analysis or critical thinking. That's why we're in school, we're in higher education, because we like to engage in higher order thinking, not dependent upon what Pops tells you what the world is about, Grandpa, Grandma, or the pastor, because they're telling you, they're articulating, they're just regurgitating that story. But when you find out that story is probably not real, then you have to go through your own analysis. I was taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America. I was taught that in my day and age. So now, critical thinking, I have to conceptualize and uh, undo layers of that type of, of teaching. When individuals or group of people do not use critical analysis approach to understanding concepts or worldview, they usually accept 
what is told to them by their teachers, individuals of authority in their lives, or by academic scholarship. So that is the reason why I'm very proud of each one of you that are here studying at Rose State and those of you that work here that are in charge of their education. That is really important. What's important too is that each one of the, the instructors, the professors, they have their scholarship. They, they have gone through multiple uh, degrees to get to that position to advance that scholarship. So my charge to you is to check them out. Is that what is, what is real within your, your, your worldview? A so, note on termination, terminology, uh, uh, the audience. I won't go through all of those things, but I use terms interchangeably. And it's because I use English as the kind of the, the, the foundation of my communication. I talk about, you know, the terms native indigenous when we're referencing indigenous peoples. The discipline of indigenous studies when referencing to indigenous education. I utilize the Columbus misnomer term Indian, referring to Indian education, Indian country, urban Indian, or has been used by individual literature. Because if I don't use that term, I'm going to lose a generation or two of individuals, which includes my own family, that might not understand the concept of indigeneity. They're going to say, what, Cornell, what does that mean? Because I was just taught I'm Indian. So I'm thinking, so where did you go to school? What public school? What boarding school? Did you learn about this type of terminology? I use the word settler as in white settler reference to non-Indigenous peoples. I use the term people of culture rather than people of color because the communities of color are, it becomes a legal term. And I, I received that information from uh, the, the Canadian colleagues that I know from this court case called uh, Sandra Lovelace. Then appreciation to the courageous communities of indigenous students that are right here, your families, your educators, who interrupted their long-standing marginalization by reclaiming native space in the school district and or higher education institutions. And then appreciate for sharing the tools and analytics to understand or intervene into settler colonial schooling. This is where I start with <coughs> the achievement gap. We know about the legacy of despair, 1492, and all of the despairs that came within the Columbia Exchange. As you begin to look at all the, 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 the fruits, the plants, and also, look at here, look at all these diseases that were imported to the Americas. And when you have these indigenous peoples that are, they're not immune to these, these diseases. So when you look at population decrease, you begin to understand what happened to a lot of the indigenous peoples. They did not kill off themselves. As you begin to see, this was important. The legacy of colonization. It's about the dehumanizing of co the colonizer and the colonized, the chosen race, the defiled race. Looking at the master narrative of freedom, civilization, progress, and democracy. And you've probably seen these, these images apart if you went to public school primarily. And then, you know, these are, this, this is just not just an imprint of Native America. These are other historical elements within the United States. Some colleagues of mine, students say, it's not the United States of America, it's the United States of Europe, if you begin to look at the history of where we're coming from. See anything familiar that stands out? I know this is dated. The class of worldviews. If we are to understand why Aboriginal and Eurocentric worldviews class, we need to understand how the philosophy, values, and the customs differ from those of Eurocentric cultures. Understanding difference of worldviews in turn gives a starting point for understanding the paradox that colonialism poses for social control. 
So this is what I put together for the visual learners to help you understand where this pedagogical engagement in this clash has come from. To look at, you know, the, the original indigenous pedagogies, and then I showed you the contrast and compare that uh, the Columbian Exchange for where the Western pedagogy, or where it's called the United States, has come, but at the cost of assimilation. And as you go in counter clockwise within this, this, this model, you're looking at uh, the colonialism, the industrial age, postmodernism, is what is to be, to be known as the knowledge culture, or is, if you're in curriculum development, who decides what is official knowledge? Because once that is decided, that's usually what is adopted into school systems, through books, through curriculum. And so, as you begin to see, there's a paradigm shift that I see, particularly coming from the Pacific Northwest, this sustainability movement was looking at this shift returning you know, to the future, looking at these wisdom cultures that have always been indigenous within the realm of regaining wholeness. And so as you begin to see, so what happened? So how come we were forced to get away from this, our original learning from teaching? This is a hierarchy of power and control, privilege, oppression, experiences, <laughs> intersectionality is life. This has come from uh, uh, Dr. Avida and, and her work in social, uh, social work. As you begin to look at, you know, the, um, the, the, the hierarchy of, of affluence men, uh, white men, upper middle, you, look, you can see the middle class, the working class, and then the poor, you know, the single parent families of color, youth of color, or, you know, uh, of, of culture. A lot of students, you know, within, you know, places that I went to say, Cornell, you know what? You might be able to, uh, uh, to put me in the basement. That's where I am. If you're a creator another level, I'm in that basement. I want to get out. As you begin to see that. And actually, this is a game that I play in my class for more, a lot of the graduate students. I put a, a, a triangle, I take the triangle on the floor, and I have all the students position themselves in their spot. Some don't want to play. Some students say, well, that's called white privilege. You don't want to play the game of life. He said, I can't, I don't have that privilege. I have to work it out because I'd like to be up there too. So they position themselves, all 30 in class. They said, okay, so what can we do to work this out? They said, we gotta collaborate, we gotta talk, we gotta talk about where we come from, how to make an equal playing field. There's more than eight, but this is a good jump start to talk about the settler colonialism. Number one, Southern Colonial will take indigenous land and natural resources. Two, will take the children. Three, will take the religion and spirituality. Four, will take away the languages. Five, will take away the ways of teaching and learning. Six, will debate the concept of tribal sovereignty. Seven, will falsify the human record. That means, you know, just manufacture the reality. Six, that is eight will engage in Western hegemonic research protocol and practice. And so you can see this is what the, this is what caused the intergenerational re This is the interruption of our traditional systems. Starting with Carlisle Indian School. Now these are, these are young children and I don't know who out there has young children or takes care of your babies. But look at these young, these are like three, four year olds. And they don't live close, they're like three or four states away from Pennsylvania. And they're not gonna go home every holiday. They're not gonna go home every year. They might not even go home. So I just thought I'd share that story with you because this was United States policy. 
situating knowledge systems, the decolonization process, particularly for those of you who are going to be students or teachers or even researchers, because this is what I think you're going through now. You're going through the wounding period of your life because you're evolving in your consciousness. You're rediscovering and recovering. Two, you remember it because you know what happened to you and your people. So you begin to mourn. Three, you're going through a cleansing period. You begin to dream of how things could be. And then four, the healing, the commitment, and the action. Actually doing something. But one thing really important, working with so many uh, in collaboration and community, in action is really action. It means that you choose not to do anything. Framing post-colonial indigenous research paradigms. And so, you know, I have just a few books that I can put in my backpack, but there's, these are the ones that I'm really close to uh, in, my, in my study. These are always like a, um, a probably an arm, arm link from where I could reach them so I could make references. But as you begin to look at um, research that seeks to clarify post-colonial research thought at the beginning of the new millennium, I want to cut to the four urgent issues. Number one is mapping, diagnosing, healing colonial indigenous peoples, and then imagining post-colonial visions. Assist the process of decolonization of structural racism. Every researcher and student has been a victim and beneficiary of the same educational system of teaching and learning. Few persons are privileged with the knowledge base of how to achieve a decolonized education. We all must become culturally responsive in our teaching and learning processes, move towards critical consciousness and become healers within our wounded spaces. That's where I see a lot of the teachers because you have to be the healer. You got to be the strong one. It's like the, the idea when you go, you fly in a plane, the, the, the flight attendant, you know, say, okay, you got the oxygen coming down, and you got your babies next to you, you don't give the oxygen to the baby. You, you take it first, because you got to be the care, care, care person for the little ones. Same process here. Theoretical constructs. I love reading Audre Lorde's work. She said the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so as I begin to take classes in uh, nation building, I'm looking at saying something very similar. I'm saying settler colonial tools will never rebuild native nations. Thus, settler colonial theoretical frameworks will never rebuild indigenous schools and structures. So if you're thinking about designing an indigenous school, forget about the American model. And that really is a trip for individuals that are not conditioned, colonized within their mindset of American structures. Letter grades, evaluations, things of that order. Designing culture responsive curriculum. It's looking like a transformational knowledge base. Your culture caring and building a learning community, cross-culture and diversity communications, and your pedagogy in the classroom. This is the framework because I was schooled in public schools. That was like almost over 40 years ago. This hasn't changed much since I returned here to Oklahoma. And I see these same domains. Smack me in the face. You become very individualistic. You become very materialistic. You become very competitive and Eurocentric. That's what I find and witness as an outcome of public education. I don't know about you, but that's what I witnessed in my experience. So when we look at holistic ways of teaching and learning, this is polar opposite. Cognitive blocks created by public education. So I don't know those of you that are going into education or you're into uh, sociology, but it, you know that's kind of my framework. But students' consciousness is grounded in Eurocentrism, speaking mainly the English language. 
then your attitudes of superiority and difference are, are deficiency in, in discourse, which is the deficient syndrome. Settler dominance and advantage are the benchmark of the status quo. Lean exposure to teacher education program and leadership training, particularly with the, and not just the equity lens, but an indigenous lens. That is rare. Limited knowledge of indigenous perspectives and pathway, and then the politics overrides academic concerns as critical consciousness on the post-colonial indigenous research paradigms are legislated out of schools. The process of infusing cultural content across the curriculum, talked about power and place, the ability to define reality, and then what is the response of higher education in the construction of that reality? That is where the professor, the instruction, that's where we come in to help you understand what is real. Universities are full of academics that are dedicated to most of their time to purposeful create stories and images of what they think is real. Hours, years of time creating their reality. What's the response of the academy to affirm diversity and indigeneity? That's my question. By us just being here, just honoring Native American Month, you know, that is at least a step forward for creating safe place and indigeneity. Why do you think we need a conscious pluralistic priority at this time? Xenophobic language is invented to frighten evolving critical consciousness away from pluralizing the curriculum. Deterrent terms like political correctness, revisionist, or manufactured concepts in opposition to critical race theory instead of academic correctness or cultural correctness and responsive, or just plain correct. Don't need to spin it. Oftentimes, politics overrides academic concerns. As critical consciousness of some of the post-colonial indigenous research paradigms are legislated, I think I said that before. So, as learners, as students, we got some homework. <coughs> so I wonder what your homework is in looking at red pedagogy. A problem of consciousness, a homework, a journey for serious educators and students, a pur purposeful bibliography, and who should do this homework? And growing in a study group and setting an agenda for the future. I mean, that's, that's just me, the teacher and me. Teacher signed me homework. That was it. Okay, this is the backlash. We know the empire will strike back. The uncontested acceptance of national, state, high states testings as valid and reliable measures of teacher and student excellence. Privatization and of public schooling, resurgence of cultural deficit ideology, and the notion that the United States must continue to spend money on war in order to remain competitive in the world order. That's Roberta Alquist in the book called Assault Up on Ship on Kids. What is real pedagogy? This is framed from Sandy Grandy's book, uh, Red Pedagogy. Memory scholars and educators are mostly resistant to engage with critical educational theory, tending to concentrate instead on the production of historical monographs, ethnographic studies, tribal centered curriculum, and site based research. This focus stems from the fact that most Native American scholars feel compelled to address the social and economic urgencies of their own communities against which engagement in its abstract theory appears to be a luxury of the academic elite. While Grandy acknowledges the dire need for practical community-based research, she maintains that the global en en encroachment on indigenous land, resource, culture, and communities points to the equal urgent need to develop transcendent theories of decolonization and to build broad-based coalitions. Intersectionality, help me, I'll help you. From theory to practice. Remember, inaction is really action. The red nation realizes we must undertake the realistic and principled action now that we will help 
build our community capacity for revolution in the future. We must not turn away from the truth. We do not yet possess the capacity for revol revolution. Otherwise, we would have seen unified mass movements come out of the remarkable revolution energy of the past decades. And yet, we have very little time to get there. This is the contradiction and the duty of our generation. Decolonization or extinction. That is straight out of Red Nations. <coughs> right here. <coughs> Students, you need everyone to have a copy of that. So this is my antidote, particularly working with pre-service teachers. Those that are going into the classroom to teach a multicultural society. So doing this much at the University of Kansas decades ago, I began to see a collective skill set of many of those students who are soon, within a year or two, going to be classroom teachers. And I was scared to death. I said, where did you go to school? And to go back to those four domains of public education. And so I created this, this rung, which is the bottom rung, to developing consciousness about culture. And it comes from uh, James Banks and Michael Yellowbird's work on critical thinking. So this contributions approach, and we're, here we are in Native American Month, is a part of that sample. But it's the banking and holding, and holding actions because the, the principles or characteristics of those individuals, institutions, or organizations have an unreflective thinking and they, they're challenged think, thinkers. They have a captive or they have a colonized mind. They're unaware and unconscious of significant cultural issues in society. They're unreflective thinkers. They challenge Eurocentric thinkers. They have assimilation behavior. Their actions are ethnic cheerleading. Ethnic cheerleading. Native American Month. Women's Month. Black Heritage Month. That's, to me, ethnic cheerleading. Action, the disconscious of racism. I put DYS, like dysfunctional, because in my practice of going all of these classrooms of student and teacher observations, I've seen a lot of disconsciousness happen in the pedagogical engagement of the teachers. I'll give you one classic elementary class, first grade the teacher comes in to the little first graders and says, okay, let's get in a circle, hold hands, and say, hold hands, and they say, okay, kids, sit down, Indian stop. And they go sit down and they go like this. And I'm thinking, oh, no, don't, don't do that. Don't say that. And so I do post-conference with the teacher. And I said, you know, I'd like to talk to you about what you just said. I said, Mrs. Smith, would you say, sit down, black man, stop? I said, no, I would never say that. Mrs. Smith, would you say, sit down, Asian, stop? I, I would never say that. Mrs. Smith, would you say, Sit down, Mexican style, would never say that. But Mrs. Smith, you said sit down, Indian style. So, oh, well that's what I was taught. That's what my teacher taught me. I learned that from my parents in that school. That's where this disconsciousness occurs. Which means that an individual is so far <coughs> removed from the culture, the reality, they don't even know that they are. And so the commodification of mindfulness takes place, rediscovery, and decolonization in front of the novice learner. So once you get out of this and move in towards critical consciousness, you can move into the additive approach. The beginning teacher beginning to think, practical thinking approach to, de to construct and change structures in the framework, burst of critical awareness. Oh, I got it. I'm getting it. <coughs> tries to colonize oneself, but without regular practice. 
It's not a study group. It's just maybe reading a book. But still embraces the mechanical Eurocentric thinking with fixed structures that lack critical attributes of human living systems. And they start to mourn because they come from this, this part here. They've got to, you know, to, to forgive themselves. They've been so colonized. They're beginning to tear up. And then they move into this shift. Oh, so I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to shift to conscientization, Paula Ferrer's term, to an advanced thinker and approach to liberatory pedagogy, regularly practice decolonization, and advances practice accordingly. I mean, the regular. To me, that's daily. Not just a course. Here's the book we wrote for those students, particularly undergraduate students. This is a handbook for decolonization. So you begin to desire to decolonize minds. So you, they have a guilt complex for siblings or classmates that are still stuck here or stuck here and they want to help them come up and said, no, you can't steal their learning. They got to go on their own processes of deconstructing their own colonization. And then the top here is culture and social justice, the transformation, the complex thinker, approach to indigenous pathways and freedom, intellectual creativity, genius virtues that become second nature. You become the teacher of teachers. The protector of second knowledge, engaged in surgical research, commitment to action. So we build on the scholarship of multiculturalism and the indigenous studies, the transformation of these practice model is to develop critical understanding and employment of decolonizing theories and pedagogies. So this is what the nature of the book that, uh, that uh, we wrote as collaborators coming out next, uh, next year by Teachers College Press. It's called Unsettling Settler Colonial Education. So there has always been resistance and struggles. So as you begin to look at the Chronicle, and now we have history professors that are here, you know that enough's been enough for indigenous people. The Pueblo revolt happened when you have Pueblos that don't usually talk to one another. But when it came to threat of life and death because of the Spaniards, they did. They came together. That's called the Great Unification. Tecumseh's Rebellion, the same way. Northwest Coastal Fishians. Custer died for your sins by Vine Deloria Jr. That should be everybody's library, not just native. The 20 points program by the, the, the trail of broken trees. The red power movement. And I got uh, Clyde Warrior's book right here of one of the architects of the American Indian movement who happens to be from Oklahoma, who happens to be Ponca, who happens to be fluent Ponca speaker champion war dancer. So the longest walk from Alcatraz to Washington, D.C. That experience comes from my brother, my younger brother, who's now passed on. He was on that walk. And my, my father met him in Washington, D.C. Efforts to free Leonard Peltier happening today. Dakota Pipeline demonstration and looking at all the water protectors. Missing and murdered indigenous women, recovered multiple student grave sites at Indian boarding schools is rampant. So you're looking at what is this decolonization? It's an unsettling process that it involves repatriation of indigenous people's lands, lives, and rights. The colonizer <coughs> freed from the colonists' control and colonizers returned to their own lands. This is Brother Gelliberg. He, like I, we start our classes with meditation. It may be just two or three minutes, but at least calms us down. But a lesson comes later on about what is neural decolonization. What does that do for our mind? 
How do we bring peace to ourselves and calmness, especially when you live in urban areas, urban cities, the urban forest? These are social work master students. What is the antidote? This comes from Reclaiming Indigenous uh, Voice, right here. Reclaiming Indigenous Voice and Vision. Travel, building of old alliances and kinship across borders, and this discovery of like-minded people in other parts of the globe. In other words, the antidote is the discovery of other colonized people who share the same experience and feelings. The discovery, I submit, demonstrates that the colonizers lie and that the feelings and the beliefs of the colonized, far from being strange or backwards, are the feelings and beliefs of most humanity. So as you look at the intertribalness of where you come from, students, you're going to compare and contrast your story. You're going to say, where are you from? I ask my students that all the time, where are you from? Especially when I was in Kansas, they would say, oh, I'm from Topeka, or I'm from Wichita, or I'm from, you know, Happy Valley, or I'm from, you know, uh, Colby. I said, no, no, where did you originally come from? And some, disconscious, oh, I came from uh, Wichita, I came from uh, 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 Colby, I came from um, places in Kansas. I said, okay, start where the learner is, Cordell. That's where they are. So where my mind was, where did you originate? Where is your creation story? More so, how did you get here? What happened along the way? That is a story. Who's going to tell that story if it's not us? And then once you got here, what are we going to do about it? We've got to work it out. You cannot be the doctor if you are the disease. That is simple. That, that is common sense. And this is resilience to colonization as a testimony to the understanding of oppression and the sources of their own healing, recovery, and renewal. To continue this medical analogy, this wisdom may become the antidote, vaccine for a disease that is old as humanity. Back to the Future, Red Pedagogy. Spiritual movements, traditional ceremonies, major form of success, resistance to American colonialism, especially now COVID-19. Looking at what we have that's left. And all these were against the law until about 1930s. The sun dance, the ghost dance, the big drum, long, long house, smoke house, dream dances, medicine lodge. These were our practices that took care of our, our, our souls. So I just thought I'd share that with you because this is my last slide. This is how we can stay in touch. But I'd like to conclude by uh, singing a song. And you might already know this song. But some students that are probably not my age never heard it, especially native students. So you help me if you know it.
that's the theme to American Indian Movement. <laughs> Many of you would probably recognize that, but uh, that's a lot of the, the, the national anthem from the days that I grew up, times that I witnessed uh, various learners in spirit, in, I was inspired by uh, the, the talks of, uh, of Leonard Peltier, I was inspired by John Trudell, uh, the Banks brothers, um, a lot of the early American Indian movement leaders. Um, I was a little younger than them, but uh, I was able to listen to them because I, I'd rather listen to them that, than a lot of the professors, the coursework that I was getting at universities that I was going to at that time. So what I'm saying to you, what I'm sharing with you, is not anything new. I'm just echoing out what I've been taught, what I've learned. So I hope that it helps. And if it's stuck with you, it makes a difference to me, to what you're doing and give you purpose for why you're studying what you're studying and to move on. Because we need a lot of help. That great unification is happening right now. And that's that collective. And so that's what I wanted to share with you. And I thank you very much, Dr. Bain, for having me be here this, this afternoon with you. And perhaps we have some time for Q&A, some questions? Yes, if anybody, if, yeah, we can, we'd love to do that. So uh, anybody have any questions? We'll get more depth on things that Dr. Bain has combined us with. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Dr. Yes. Bain, oh, I'm sorry. You talked about a conscious, pluralistic, I don't remember the last word. It was before the red pedagogy. Should be right there. The conscious pluralistic priority. Yeah. What do you mean by that? A conscious pluralistic priority. To me, that means what is your agenda? Why 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 are you doing what you're doing? What is it is important? This is um, one of the reasons. Oh, I think you gave me one of the books right there. That book. Man, man, this is a product of a conscious pluralistic priority. The real deal, indigenous action to save our earth, looks at not only the manifestos over the decades, but it's giving recommendations. And these come from mostly students that major in Native American studies. Because um, I'm a graduate of the University of New Mexico, I'm proud that many of those students that I know, they are the authors of a lot of these, these textbooks that are coming out today. So the priority is the agenda. What is the agenda? Is it nationhood? Is it MMIW? What is it that is on your mind that, that is close to you? Something that just, you wake up, just you can't wait to get to it. I mean, what is it that moves you, that means so much? I mean, that, that's what I meant by a conscious, pluralistic priority at this time. I hope that helps. Oh. There was a question over here. Yes. Early in your slides, you talked about um, the, the language as a life force, as a fundamental indigenous value. Could you elaborate on that? That I'm speaking with you in English is something that I had to learn because I'm a product of the public schools. And so as you begin to relearn the language, you begin to look at um, word order, construction, looking at the way the mind works and how the language is constructed. And so when you have a um, first word order, a, a, a sequential order of how to speak, how to write, therefore it's a, it's a, it's a conditioning, it's a training. But it makes it even more serious because you're involved in school work, studies, papers, articles, books. So you're forced to write in American writing styles. You're forced 
to read top <coughs> to bottom. You're forced to read left to right. And I've always, my mind always questioned, teacher, why, why do we do that? Why are you teaching us to read this way? And I could tell it irritated my teacher. It really, because she couldn't explain it to me. And so I began to think about what other world cultures, how do they speak? How do they talk? What gender uh, preferences do they have? What, uh, what are the protocols that they use to talk to one another? Um, what is the space? What's the pedagogical space that we have? Who can speak in behalf of somebody? That, that's an art. You know, that, that's really important. I have my students introduce each other. And that's sometimes hard if you haven't really practiced that. But I call that prologue. Ability to introduce a relative. Ability to introduce a new colleague to somebody else that you don't even know. Because you have to do that because of the love that you have. But it's a skill set. It's a skill set. And even the, the little ones that, uh, that we have, the Comanche uh, Academy, the charter school, we, so we start with the littles, with pre-K, K, and first grade. But we already built a podium just like this. But it's half the size. It's this, this size. And I tell the children, he said, that's you. You're going to be the keynote. And don't be afraid to speak. Because I, I go out to all these, quote, Indian schools, and these kids, they're shy. There's something about public speaking as a phobia. I say, you got to break that. And the best way is to get up there and practice. Practice. Especially if you're going to be a teacher. And so that visual is that little podium. So they come in, see that little emblem of their school, and said, that's going to be you. We're going to teach you as early as we can how to be a keynote speaker. That way you come out of your shyness. And the parents are just glowing. They said, that's unheard of. Teachers, that's unheard of. But that, that's what I meant. But speaking in English or art, because, it, because it's a dual language uh, school, so we're, we're, we're integrating Comanche language as well, and singing. Yes? I caught the PBS special on the Carlisle boarding school, and just as a non-speaker, <coughs> that was really new to me, and I just wondered if you had seen that, and haven't we seen anything um, that we really know, is it colonized or not? I think I could go back to here just to understand, you know, what's going to the mind, not only these kids, but the caretakers, the caregivers. Where do you think they're thinking? They're thinking, I hope my teachers are taking good care of them. I hope that they don't run out of medicine when they get sick. I hope they don't get whipped. But you know, that's what happened. So that's why we have this intergenerational grieving that's going on. I'm trying to look at the uh, the your 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 question because it does it impact the colonizer and the colonized at the same time. But this is, this was a, to me was important because it began to see, particularly if you're a researcher, you're going into a community and you're conducting research, you're going into a damaged community. You're not going into a community that everything's hunky-dory. You're going into a colonized community. <coughs> and so the researcher has to understand that before they do any kind of survey, any kind of interview, anything. You're going into a very colonized community, systemically colonized community. So that causes the wound. And then the to remember the mourning, and then the cleansing, and then the healing that takes place.
Does this make sense? I mean, to me, this is me 40 years, almost 50 years ago. I mean, from where I'm at in Lawton, Lawton Public Schools, it didn't change much. And I could ask you, what's your story? It might be close to this. If so, we got work to do. Not just the diversifying, but those that are involved in nationhood, it's indigenizing. Any other questions? Students, what's on your mind? Yes. How do we, um, how do we bring recognition to what happened to Native peoples in the public schools? I mean, I know the critical race theory, um, but how can we get that put in there? Because that's, that's when I feel like when the healing really starts. Because when somebody's murdered and they can't start healing until that's mm -hmm. found out. And yeah. that's how I feel about that. How, how do you get that? The Osages already know this story. Yeah. They already know that. Who doesn't know it is the colonizer. And then we get to see that as a, wow. I didn't know that. Nobody <coughs> told me that. It's like the Tulsa race riots. Yeah. It's like nobody told me the real story. Nobody told me the truth. And it goes back into Columbus. Nobody told me the truth. So yeah, you got a really good question. You got people that are grieving because of what all these murders, and now you bring it to the surface, and then you may even be, people have doubts that this is real, or they'll spin it. That's called a politics of distraction. That's a strategy. So yeah, it starts internally to talk about that. So. The Tulsa race riots resulted in curriculum that addresses that in Tulsa public schools. Pawhuska or Osage County would probably do the same thing here. And I could say that for every nation, 39 nations here in Oklahoma. Because I, I work with a lot of these school districts and the natives, the teachers, sometimes they're caught in the conundrum because it, you know they either don't rock the boat because they just got hired or they're about to retire. And you're changing the system, you're changing the curriculum. And so the inaction is action. So that's why the study groups, the consciousness evolving, courses that are evolving in, in, in higher education bring this to the forefront. That scholarship. And who's mostly driving this scholarship? Our people, our ancestors. Because it's a living testimony to talk about, you know, what we'd be able to do. To hear Vine Deloria, to hear Hank Adams, to hear, you know, the, the, the Means brothers, John Trudell. I mean, that's my age. That's why I'm saying all I'm sharing with you, I'm echoing what I was told and what I was taught. And those are my teachers. So now it, I'm just happened to be writing about it in a scholarly way, using research. And so I'm, I'm glad it's a lot of validity, but you know, of course, like in Oklahoma, the Empire Strike Back, HB 1775, don't teach critical race theory. I said, I don't. I teach indigenous research, insurgent research. That's called self-determination. That's what I teach. And I do it at University of Washington. I do it at Bake Home and any other place that, I, you know, the, that asked me to teach now that I'm retired. Any other questions? Yes? that are still open. You know what? Um, the native boarding schools that are still open, they're open for a purpose. They really are. I think that uh, the, 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 the conundrum is that um, they're mostly, um, they're still framed with that Eurocentric uh, structure because their policies come from the Bureau 
of Indian education. They're still colonial, but they still take care of the children that are in the system, the foster, the social work uh, systems. And so there's a dire need, even today, for boarding schools. But many schools that are exercising their sovereignty are getting away. We, we just created our own charter school. But it's not, it's, it's not just here in Oklahoma. There's, there are indigenous charter schools all over the country. So we got sister schools, brother schools. So we borrow curriculum. So we have that in place, the curriculum in place. What we do not have in place is the consciousness. That's why I present red pedagogy. Yes? I was wondering, um, as far as somebody who's um, trying to seek for their doctors, um, my topic is basically for remediation. And one thing I'm having a problem with is expressing myself to educational reform. I mean, we talked about the critical race theory, we talked about urban capital theory, but what I want to do is change something. And how do you go about changing something when everything else is so, um, I would have to say, to the part where you don't want to rock the boat, <laughs> but yet you do because you feel like it's a good idea, but all your research that you're trying to get it's already talked about the same thing, nothing is new. Mm -hmm. So a lot of researchers have done the same topic, but nothing is new, it's not fixable. Um, students still have to pay for it, students lose self-attrition, they lose self-efficacy, and um, remediation it costs, and you don't get any credit for it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of students um, believe that it's not worth it. So how can you go about changing the ed educational reform when nobody wants to hear your well, you move into communities that do. You move into nurtured communities, people that will welcome you. And there are a lot of communities that are welcome to reform. I just presented a whole hour of just, you know, this is like back to the future. Yeah. I wish somebody would have taught me this 40 years ago. Very true. 40 years ago, and here I am, like in kindergarten, relearning. So yeah, it just, it's a matter of finding that study group or that professor that's courageous, is already doing that work. Or a brother and sister that just got burned out. Because you can't do all this all the, all the time. I mean, you'll get burned out. <coughs> you'll step back. Because I know a lot of leaders that, student leaders, says, I, can't, I can't do this all by myself. I'm getting beat up. Not just physically, but here, mentally and spiritually, I'm getting beat up. Nobody wants to do this. They want the feel-good curriculum, not social justice curriculum. And I see that as well. So yeah, it's, it's building your community. And then once you build a community, your study group, that's why I put that homework, homework assignment, your bibliography, share that bibliography with you know, those who are like mine and you'll see the scholarship that is focused on this topic area. There's power in numbers. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, Matthew, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm all sweaty and ready to eat. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you. And I'd like to commemorate uh, Sister Cindy, my daughter, Chantel, and of course my partner is, is, is home. I wouldn't be anywhere without my family. That's really important. I wouldn't be anywhere. She's uh, Nakonis, my, my partner. She's home studying for Oklahoma Bar. She graduated to Oregon Law School, and uh, she's adamant she wants to finish, get her law degree. Because we need a lawyer in our family. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> we got some problems to solve. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me, to invite me to be here. and. Uh, let me know what else I can do. I'm just, I'm just down the road in Lawton, and um, I love to come uh, speak in some of your classes. Um, we, we got, we got a little drum group. If you need uh, singers, every Wednesday night, except tomorrow night because we have the death of the family. All these little ones, we all the grandpas sit in between them, and we're teaching them how to sing on the drum, and the little girls behind them, they're dancing. 
and Cindy's in the back uh, sewing uh, outfits for the little ones. And because hardly any of our kids, and they're all native kids, they're mostly Comanche, but they've never danced before. And so we're gonna bring them all into the arena together next month. She's making their outfits. That's how much love it is. I'm gonna give you the microphone right now to give you a, a chance to give a shout out and just talk about the Comanche Academy. <laughs> Um, he always does this to me, so I think that's why he brings me along. Um, <clears throat> it's funny because, you know, when he was talking about these things, I began to, to, to tear up, to kind of go back into those feelings. Because I've lived this life 50 years, not knowing what a sacred woman is, not knowing what a red road was. I only learned how to be Indian when I was, sort of, when I was 36 starting and really not sewing only cutting fabric <laughs> so i don't you know um but i have to start somewhere and so the community academy we began a design team uh 2015 <clears throat> and i was telling Chantel, where i recently met that when he came back from seattle i had just come back from san francisco and so san francisco has a great bay area indigenous community they were um, with the Relocation Act back in the 60s. And uh, of course, those people out there took Alcatraz. And so we're like, aim all the way, right? And so, um, but the mentors out there, you know, they, they help each other. They don't hinder each other. They uplift and uphold, no matter what native you are. It doesn't even matter if you're not native. If you're Thaiwa, Thaiwa, you Thaiwa, whatever, Come in and help us, well, you know. They did it at Alcatraz. They couldn't get over there without boats. The community out there brought them up, brought them food, brought them clothing, brought them wood. And so the charter school was the idea about this red pedagogy, about understanding that we, we don't know our culture and, and we have to start somewhere. And it was important that we um, understood with each other how to go forward. So here comes Dr. Peter Woody. And I knew the name as, I knew his father as Dr. P. Woody. Like people called him Doc P. Or Doc P. Woody. And when I heard of Dr. P. Woody, I'm like, who's that? <laughs> but the name changed, see? Even, the, even our own people changed that name because of this lateral oppression, because that's the way they were taught to say it. But the actual enunciation, pronunciation, is Pee Wee And then I don't think it was even that, was it? It was, uh, it was something else, and uh, they couldn't even uh, um, put into words. So for us, when we started this charter school, we thought, you know, we have these little kids that don't know, and their parents that don't know, and then the community that don't know, and then, you know, elders that are just that are dying, that we need to re, you know, bring into the system, the circle of life, this, this medicine wheel ideation. And so these little children, you know, their families were at powwows, so we would set up at powwows. And we would say, I'm saying, we yeah, have this indigenous charter school, it's, you know, Comanche centered and it's indigenous culture, and we're gonna teach language, and we're gonna, you know, teach by the seasons, and Oh yeah, we have to do curriculum, you know, with the state of Oklahoma, which, by the way, and that when we started was last. We were last in the United States in education. Our children were learning at the lowest rate, and our Indian children don't even make it to high school, and they don't make it to college. If they make it to college, they don't make it through college, right? And so for us, we were, I was like, man, I was that child. Dropped out in 10th grade because my history teacher was teaching history wrong. I told him about it. He said, ma'am, you can leave. I left. I didn't come back to school. It was my first 10th grade year. Second 10th grade year, I was taught by an Indian woman, my own aunt, that it's not good to be that way, to wear a bandana in class. Right? As a Native woman, you can't do that in Cash, Oklahoma. My own aunt said that. I left. Dropped out second time. So for me, I've been in college since I was 36, 
finally trying to get my education, sometimes one class, one class at a, a semester. Doesn't matter, just do it. So when we're teaching in that way, we're also learning how we're indigenous, how we create, and teaching that to our children. So like I said, I wasn't really sewing, I'm only like cutting fabric, right? I don't even know how to stitch the lines. But the elders come in just yesterday and was like, no, you do it this way, and you're gonna have to hand stitch it. You know, make it way harder. Because that's what I was taught. There's systems, and there's organizations, and there's um, protocols, and there's uh, fun, you know, there's, there's ways you have to do things. I'm learning that, oh my gosh, it's like, imagine a bunch of teachers coming into the academy with colonized education, trying to teach indigenous ideation curriculum. We're bumping each other's heads, like we don't know. And so as long as we understand we don't know what we don't know, we're okay, we're gonna to learn together. We're gonna to fail, and we're gonna get back up, and we're gonna do it again. We're gonna fail, we're gonna learn, we're gonna get back up again. That's the story of our people. That's the only reason why we're here. No matter how hard it was throughout the years, our ancestors are still standing there waiting. I went up to South Dakota, and I'll stop after this. I uh, go up every year, and at that time, they were bringing children home from, still from Carlisle. And the, the uh, a medicine man there said, our children are home now to teach us how to mourn about this great catastrophe that's happened to our children. Now, our Indian education is the indigenous charter schools that are happening. They're revitalizing our people. Because we don't know, we have to learn together. Those little children, they know more Comanche than I do. And they're like four, five, six. They run down the hall talking about Kima. That means come, we're going to eat. They talk about Ura, Marowe, Konayatsa, Cindy, Fumera. They say, they say their names, they, they greet you in a good way. We were not, I was not taught that. He was not taught that. Chantel was not taught that. Those Indian women and men, they weren't taught that. And so we sit blended into the, the curriculum and society, but we are so different. And we want you to understand that with your help and with your compassion and with your understanding, we need to change what society says we are, because we are invisible in every way, shape, and form. That medicine man, he taught me how to cry. I didn't even know how to cry. Years ago, he taught me how to cry. So I just want to say thank you, and Cornell, you're always such a great mentor. If you can do anything with this man, please do. He is so kind and so compassionate, so loving. He is, is a mentor to all the people that I know, and I just appreciate the time. Oh, Dr. Yes, Thank you. One, one message I'd like to leave with you is that, you know, I've been in education for a long period of my, my life. <laughs> And I knew, and I knew that um, being a principal of schools, that um, there was something wrong when our, most of our children, particularly elementary children, K through eight, were mostly being channeled to child study teams because I knew where that was going. They're going into special ed. They're all going. To, they don't have learning uh, disabilities, but that's where they were being channeled. They were being referred by their teachers. A critical mass in your school of native kids in a public school going into special ed. And so I knew at that time, this is like 30 years ago, I said, you know what? If we don't change the system and reform, it's going to continue. And our kids are going to continue to drop out, rock bottom academic scores. And so I ventured to guess if we don't do, if we don't change, this is like 20 years ago. If we don't change the school systems today, this generation of kindergarten throughout the country, by the t they, they will not reach graduation by the time they get into high school. They're not going to graduate. Half of them are not going to graduate. The entire kindergarten class across the country, not just here in Oakland, the entire country, all the native kindergarten will not graduate 
from high school. Half of them will be gone. That's when that was serious to me, is that we gotta do something about it. And it's not them, it's the system. So we gotta go in to change that. So that's where all this work comes in. So that's where the scholarship reached out to colleagues of any color, any age, any gender, comes to help. So we need a lot of help right here. So that's that's what I present to you. I mean, this is this is where we got to work this out. We don't want anybody to go away. We're not asking you to give up your land. But we'd be happy to have some land. <laughs> <laughs> the book's about land, land back. <laughs> but we got to work this out. But it's about living together differently. That's what it's about about sovereignty, government to government sovereignty. Anybody else? Well, man, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. David Rudy for coming today, sharing his, his views, his vision. Um, I hope that we can, each one of us, take some of this in our own personal studies, but even at an institutional level, that we can um, consider uh, reconfiguring the way that we consider, uh, the way that we look at our, the way that we educate, and that we can be an, an, an integral part here, let's say, of Rose State, of uh, elevating uh, the educational experience for Native peoples. As I, when I first came here, I, my, my goal has always, to, uh, has always been to make um, Rose State the community college of choice for Native peoples here in Oklahoma, if we can. But we have to first understand how to achieve that through maybe realigning our, our systems of, of, of education and, and, and understanding the needs of our Native students. And we can be great agents of that. I've seen a lot of nods from my colleagues. So in the vernacular, we will powwow on this. All right. Ah, okay, so. and it, all right. So, um, hey, uh, let's uh, thank you for coming. And we'll go ahead. Have we got any food still left? All right, so we've got some, some corn soup, some great dumplings. We've got any meat pies still left? Run, go get them. All right, so, all right, thank you. Have a great day.